doctor Michael Matthews. Les voy a mencionar algunas muy brevemente de sus eh, virtudes académicas. Él eh, viene de la Universidad de New South Wales en Australia y es fundador de un grupo internacional eh, que se dedica a la historia y la filosofía y la enseñanza de la ciencia. Eh, este grupo tiene más de 20 años y ha realizado una labor, en parte nos hablará de ella, eh, muy importante a nivel internacional. Eh, es autor de numerosas importantes publicaciones en el área, editor de la prestigiada revista Science and Education. Entre sus libros como autor, eh, voy a destacar solamente eh, un par eh, de 1994, Science Teaching, y, bueno, enseñanza de la ciencia, no está en español, no está traducido, esa sería realmente una buena labor. Eh, el papel de la historia y la filosofía de la ciencia, y en 2000, tiempo para la educación de la, cien, eh, de la ciencia, eh, perdón, cómo, cómo la eh, enseñanza de la, de, del movimiento del péndulo eh, ha apoyado la enseñanza eh, de la ciencia. Eh, ha editado seis libros, entre los cuales se encuentra ciencia y, edu, edu, Enseñanza de la Ciencia y Cultura, El Papel y la Historia y la Filosofía de la Ciencia, El Péndulo, que es un libro del que nos, nos hablará en, en buena medida hoy. Eh, tiene 29 capítulos en libros, diferentes eh, lenguas, 47 artículos en revistas especializadas. Realmente eh, para nosotros es un honor contar con la presencia del profesor Michael Martin para hacer la conferencia inaugural. Quiero comentarles que el profesor Matthews no habla español y no tuvimos recursos para hacer una traducción simultánea. La conferencia la va a dictar en inglés. Lo que sí pudimos hacer fue la traducción de un PowerPoint, un, una traducción muy nutrida, eh, para que ustedes puedan ir acompañando la presentación que él irá haciendo. Eh, no, no, lamentamos pues no, no poder hacer esta traducción simultánea, de otra manera hubiera sido muy difícil. Pero bueno, esperemos que eh, esto genere todo el, el interés y la inquietud eh, que debe generar pues, de, este trabajo que se está realizando, eh, del cual forma parte todo un movimiento para la enseñanza de la ciencia, con una eh, énfasis especial en el papel de la, de la historia y la filosofía, como eh, dando cuerpo a ese eh, fundamento, sustento, a esa forma de enseñar a, o para la enseñanza de la ciencia. Vamos a darle la palabra entonces para empezar lo más puntualmente posible al profesor Michael Matthews y le damos la bienvenida, por, además venir desde Australia hasta estas tierras no, no es poco, no es fácil y le agradecemos mucho. Ok. Ah, <risa> Thank you for turning up to listen to a talk on the pendulum. The pendulum is the topic voted every year the most boring topic in physics. <laughs> so for an audience to turn up to listen to the most boring topic in physics, you are to be congratulated. And I will scheduled a one-hour presentation and people might well ask how can a person talk for one hour <laughs> about this? Right. Uh, you would think talking for a couple of minutes would fully exhaust whatever can be said about this object. Well, The point of my talk is to say that if teachers have an understanding of the history of pendulum motion studies, and if they have an understanding of the philosophy or the methodology of pendulum motion studies, then this topic, which is the most boring in all of physics, can be made very interesting and very engaging, uh, but beyond being made interesting and engaging for physics, it can shed light upon the nature of science. Okay, let's see whether this works. 
History, philosophy and science teaching is something that I have been involved in for many years. In 1994, I published the book Science Teaching, The Role of History and Philosophy of Science. In that I said, <clears throat> for all its faults, the scientific tradition has promoted rationality, critical thinking and objectivity. It instills a concern for evidence and for having ideas judged not by personal or social interest, but by how the world is, a sense of cosmic piety, as Bertrand Russell called it. The vitality of the scientific tradition and its positive impact on society depends upon children being successfully introduced to its achievements, its methods and its thought processes by teachers who understand and value science the history and philosophy of science contributes to this understanding and valuation. I wrote that in the preface in 1994, and uh, I still, of course, maintain those views. Concerning the pendulum, in the year 2000, I, uh, for 10 years before the year 2000, but in the year 2000, I published a book, Time for Science Education, how teaching the history and philosophy of pendulum motion can contribute to science literacy. This brought together my own historical and scientific and philosophical studies on the pendulum. Uh, it's perhaps worth mentioning that the book has 1,300 references. And again, people might think, how can 1,300 articles be written on the pendulum? Well, what I hope to show is that this very simple little device has a terribly sort of rich history uh, and that indeed 1,300 articles uh, have and can be written. Uh, that book was the basis for a research program bringing together about 30, 35 scholars from, I think, around 20 different countries, looking at the scientific, historical, philosophical, and educational perspectives on the pendulum. I had meant to bring copies of that book with me, but in the rush to leave home, I forgot. The book is available for 25 US dollars, cheap at double the price the salesman say. Well, the pendulum's central role in early modern science. It enabled Galileo to establish the laws of free fall, Newton conservation of energy laws, enabled Newton to establish the value for G, universal gravitational constant, determine the speed of sound, by establishing that the moon falls, so to speak, at the same rate as earthly bodies fall, Newton showed that the law of gravitation is universal. He, he enabled a synthesis of terrestrial and celestial mechanics. The pendulum brought the laws of the heaven down to earth, so to speak. Importantly, it enabled accurate timekeeping with Huygens. It enabled the pressing problem of longitude to be solved, hence facilitating European exploration and colonization. Established an international unit of length, determined the speed of bullets, projectiles, etc. The simple pendulum enabled the oblate shape of the Earth to be established. This was 300 years before satellites went anywhere into space. It proved the rotation of the Earth, and it established the Earth's structure, later the Earth's structure and mass. <clears throat> so the pendulum had an central role in early modern science. Without the pendulum, more or less, there would be no early modern science as we understand it. The beginnings of pendulum studies, of course, are with Galileo. Uh, 
in Galileo's uh, uh, two chief sciences. The introduction, he says, we come now to the other questions relating to pendulums, a subject which may appear to many exceedingly arid, especially to those philosophers who are continually occupied with the more profound questions of nature. Nevertheless, the problem is one which I do not scorn. Galileo thought that, uh, at least he was relating, how questions about the pendulum seemed exceedingly arid. Uh, 300 years later, physics students today have the same view of the matter. But Galileo says, although an arid subject, it's one that we uh, ought not shun. That is, not all things that are boring should be ignored. Galileo's pendulum claims, in brief, that the period of the pendulum varies as the square root of its length, the law of length, that period is independent of amplitude, the law of amplitude, the period is independent of weight, the law of weight, and for a given length, all periods are the same, the law of isochrony, all swings take the same time. I relate that very, very quickly. The pendulum was important for establishing Galileo's new science. The bulk of day three of his 1638 discourse on the two new sciences is taken up with discussions of the properties of the pendulum. In 1639, three years before his death, he wrote that his successful investigation of free fall, a long-standing problem for natural philosophers since Aristotle, was due to the marvelous properties of the pendulum, that is, that it makes all its vibrations, large or small, in equal time. He used pendulum motion to establish the long vexed problem of free fall. How, what distance do objects fall over time? Galileo's law of length. <coughs> As for the times of vibration of bodies suspended by threads of different lengths, they bear to each other the same proportion as the square roots of the lengths of the thread. Or one might say the lengths are to each other as the squares of the times. So that if one wishes to make the vibration time of one pendulum twice that of another, he must make its suspension four times as long. I won't dally over these as I will elaborate in a while. Galileo's amplitude law. <coughs> this is from uh, the two new sciences, 1633. Truly remarkable that the same pendulum makes its oscillations with the same frequency or very little different, almost imperceptibly, whether these are made through large arcs or very small ones along a given circumference. I mean that if we remove the pendulum from the perpendicular for just one, two, or three degrees, or on the other hand, 70 degrees, or 80 degrees, or even up to a whole quadrant, it will make its vibration when it is set free with the same frequency in either case. Familiar thing that, in brief, if you let the pendulum go from out there, its time out and back is the same as if you let it go from down here, out and back. <coughs> His law of isochrony, that is that every swing takes the same time, that a falling body will require equal times to traverse the distances CA to DA indicated in the following figure. I won't go through that. He provides a ge the important thing, he provides a geometrical demonstration of his law of isochrony. What I will elaborate in a moment, and this diagram is a nice way of doing so, you can see here the bringing of mathematics into science. <clears throat> and his law continues the same with uh, Galileo's law for 
or ascertaining the path of fastest descent, the brachiostrone. He writes, if from the lowest point of a vertical circle the cord is drawn subtending an arc not greater than a quadrant, and if the two ends of the cord <coughs> of this cord, two other cords be drawn to any point on the arc, the time of descent along the two latter cords will be shorter than the first and shorter also by the sum by the same amount than along the lower of these two cords. The point he's saying there is that the path of quickest ascent is the longest path. This is counterintuitive. The quickest way to the bottom is the longest way, not the shortest way. And again, a point that uh, becomes important. What Galileo is establishing here is contrary to our intuitions contrary to our common sense and importantly the way he's establishing it is mathematically. Well without elaborating more on Galileo, Galileo's pendulum claims were opposed by a most important and impressive man, Garibaldo del Monte. Del Monte was the greatest 16th century mathematician and engineer. He was the translator of Archimedes' work. He was the director of the Venice Arsenal. He was the patron of Galileo. He secured for Galileo Galileo's first position as a teacher of mathematics at the University of Pisa. Del Monte secured for Galileo his second position as a teacher of mathematics at the University of Padua. Uh, he was an Italian nobleman. His brother was a very important cardinal in the Catholic Church. He wrote to Galileo when Galileo transmitted his pendulum discoveries uh, to his patron Del Monte. He wrote to Galileo saying, briefly speaking about these things, you have to know that before I have written anything about mechanics, I have never, in order to avoid errors, wanted to determine anything, be it as little as it may, if I had not first seen by an effect that the experience confronts itself precisely with the demonstration and of any little thing that I have made by experiment. What, Gal what Del Monte says to Galileo is that your claims about the pendulum are false. The pendulum does not behave in the way you say it behaves. Galileo replies that pendulums would behave, <coughs> as mathematically proved, if impediments and accidents and imperfections were removed. Galileo makes physics mathematical. Del Monte says, Galileo, you are a great mathematician, but you are a hopeless physicist. <laughs> physics is to tell us about how the world behaves, what happens in the world. Mathematics tells us about an idealized world, and its claims are not subject to empirical testing or verification. They're made independently of experiment. Well, the point of the debate, of course, that I want to uh, stress, the point of the debate is that you can see here at the beginning of early modern science, the mathematization of science and what that depended upon was the bringing into science as a legitimate uh, process or method, the bringing into science of idealization. Galileo says, <clears throat> when he makes claims about the pendulum, Del Monte says, what you say is not true. And consider, for instance, the famous law of isochronic motion 
The law of isochronic motion, as every physics book says, is that every swing takes the same time as any other swing. The second swing will take the same time as the first. The fourth swing will take the same time as the second and the first. So when you let it go, every swing takes the same time. That's the principle of isochrony. It's the basis of timekeeping. And of course, Del Monte said, this is demonstrably false. Because if you think about it, the law of isochrony commits you to the perpetual motion of a pendulum. If every swing takes the same time as the first, the pendulum never stops swinging. But if you let a pendulum go, as I speak, this will get to maybe 20 oscillations, and it stops. How can the law of isochrony be true if the pendulum stops? Galileo says it stops because of impediments, air pressure, friction at the fulcrum, damping effect of the string, on and on and on. And if you removed all of the impediments and imperfections, then the pendulum would never stop swinging. Well, what Del Monte says is the mathematics is fantastic, the physics is terrible. Uh, please stay with the job that I got for you as a professor of maths. Uh, well, it's easy to laugh at. But, of course, what's going on here is the very beginning of this whole new modern science, which is both idealized and mathematical. Uh, the great Huygens wrote a whole book on the pendulum. Uh, he utilized the pendulum uh, for all manner and means of things, importantly, timekeeping. I won't elaborate. Uh, Huygens was, uh, his work fell <coughs> temporally and conceptually between that of Galileo uh, and Newton. He was a bridge between the announcement and the fulfillment of the new science. His work embodied that combination of sophisticated mathematics and refined experimental technique that so characterized the new method of science being introduced by Galileo and that would be perfected by Newton. <coughs> Huygens mathematical refinement of Galileo's pendulum theory. In 1659, Huygens, then aged 30, recognized the empirical problems with Galileo's pendulum claims, problems pointed out by Del Monte, Mersenne, Ricardo, Descartes, and others. He posed himself the problem. It is asked what ratio does the time of a very small oscillation of a pendulum have to the time of perpendicular fall through the height of the pendulum? Mersenne had tried unsuccessfully to solve this problem empirically by letting the pendulum swing through a quarter circle onto a vertical wall while simultaneously dropping a weight from the point of suspension of the pendulum onto a horizontal board. Mersenne tried to adjust the horizontal board until the sound of the two impacts coincided. So we had a pendulum that would doesn't make much of a noise, sorry. Uh, this is meant to be timber, bang. Uh, and he would drop at the same time, bang. He would drop a weight and adjust a board until the bang there and the bang here coincided so that you could get the fall in free fall <coughs> judged against the swing of the pendulum. And if you had the time for the swing of the pendulum, you had the time for the drop of free fall. Importantly, 
and this is the lesson to be learned, what Huygens did was take to solve the problem mathematically. He says, we have discovered a line whose curvature is marvelously and quite rationally suited to give the required equality to the pendulum. This line is the path traced out in air by a nail which is fixed to the circumference of a rotating wheel which revolves continuously. The geometers of the present age have called this line a cycloid and have carefully investigated its many other properties. Of interest to us is that we have called the power of this line to measure time, which we found not by expecting this, but only by following in the footsteps of geometry. The famous uh, 1673 diagram on the left is from Huygens' uh, 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 hor hor horologium. Uh, his plan for the building of a pendulum clock. Uh, this plan was based on Galileo's own drawings for a pendulum clock. And importantly, he had the pendulum swing through a cycloid rather than swing through a circle. And when the pendulum swung through a cycloid, all of Galileo's pendulum laws fell into place well, timekeeping, of course, was a major event. The horological revolution resulted, sorry, before Huygens' pendulum clock, 1657, clocks could not keep time more accurately than within 15 minutes per day, 99% accuracy. They had to be checked and set daily against sundials. By 1700, they were accurate to within 10 seconds per day, 99.99% accurate. That's uh, Huygens' utilization of the pendulum for timekeeping. By 1761, John Harrison's marine chronometer would keep time accurately to within 15 seconds on a half-year voyage, 99.9999% accuracy. This Horological or timekeeping revolution resulted in immensely greater av availability of timekeepers, watches. Timekeeping entered culture and entered into society. Pendulum clocks became, became so accurate within one second in 100 days that the question of how one checked their accuracy became pressing. What was the standard against which the pendulum clock itself could be checked, and what was time that the standard supposedly measured. <clears throat> the pendulum uh, brought clarity to the chaotic uh, matters of both length and mass measurement in the early modern period. One estimate is that in France alone, there were a quarter of a million different local measures of length, weight, and volume. A quarter of a million measures of length, weight, and volume in France alone. Although the common German mile was widely used and taken to be one fifteenth of a degree at the equator in, in Vienna, it was subdivided into 23,524 work shoes whilst in Innersbrook it was subdivided into 32,000 work shoes. Some Italian states used the Italian mile, which was 1 60th of an equatorial degree and contained 5,881 Vienna work shoes. One can go on and on. Books on timekeeping and measurement have got all these very interesting figures. But you, you don't even have to read a book. You can think what the impact of this chaotic system of measurement would be on, for instance, the, the building and standardization of military weapons, on trade, on construction, boat building, commerce, and last but not least, what the impact of this chaotic system of measurements would be on science, which depends on measurement and communication. 
I won't elaborate. Well, Huygens, let me do a little demonstration here. Can I leave this to... Okay, we will come back to that in one minute, <laughs> hopefully. <clears throat> the I can't go on actually without it. <laughs> I know. Thanks. Jumping along. I have previously marked out a knot on this string and the length to the center down there is my in, in centimeter, a meter. The length to the center is one meter. Just a very quick demonstration. Uh, if people, does anybody have a watch that has timekeeping or a, a uh, spectrometer or a, a, a cell phone that can measure time? very simple. What I'm going to do, this pendulum is one meter long. It's a very rough and ready pendulum. I grabbed a nut as I left home and a bit of string. I want to measure, I want to time 20 complete oscillations. I will count one two, three, and let this go. So I'll go one, two, three, and we'll time 20 complete swings. So if people have got their timekeepers ready. One, two, three. One swing, two swings, three, four, Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen. 20. What time? 39. 40. 39.8. 40. 39.8. 40. <laughs> I know. Let's say 40 for our purposes. 40 works very well. 20 oscillations. 20 complete oscillations, which means 40 swings. Every swing took 
one second. So what I'm holding here is a second's pendulum. And Huygens realized, Huygens realized that if you have the second's pendulum, its length is standard. He said the length of the second's pendulum, which is going to be universal around the world, can be an international standard of length and overcome this chaotic system of length measurements that uh, benighted commerce and everything else, including science, in Europe. So, Huygens' basic unit of length was to be three hor horological feet, less than a millimeter short of the meter, which was subsequently uh, um, established in France. Huygens said that the seconds pendulum provided a natural unit of length, not the length of a king's arm or leg or anything, a natural unit of length, which was a constant for our purposes, one metre. Huygens thought that his universal length standard, the seconds pendulum, was dependent only upon the force of gravity, which he took to be constant all over the Earth. Assumed that the Earth itself, which everybody assumed, <coughs> that the Earth itself was spherical. If you have a spherical Earth, then the force of gravity anywhere on the surface of the Earth is constant. And if the period of the pendulum depends just on gravity, then a pendulum one metre long will take the same time to swing no matter where on the Earth's surface you are. So the length standard is transportable. The length standard, the length of the seconds pendulum in Paris will be the same as in Tokyo, the same as in Sydney, Australia, wherever you went. But, and this is a, an interesting story, 1673, John Ricker, a, uh, a French um, navigator, took and uh, took Huygens' pendulum clock to Cayenne, a uh, site of subsequently Devil's Island in French Guiana, and he found that Huygens' pendulum clock had to be shortened in order to keep time. Had to be shortened, not much, it had to be shortened roughly three millimeters in order to swing in seconds in Cayenne. <coughs> Ricker found that the uh, Huygens pendulum <coughs> clock lost two and a half minutes daily at Cayenne. So this was a big a mystery. Why was the clock losing time? How do you explain the loss of time? The slowing down of the clock. Well, there were a number of explanations that uh, Ricker was an incompetent experimenter. <laughs> Secondly, that humidity in the tropics impeded the swing of the pendulum and so slowed it down. Heat in the tropics caused the pendulum to lengthen. And the longer the pendulum, the slower the swing. The tropical environment caused increasing friction in moving parts of the clock, which slowed it down. So these were all uh, accounts put forward to explain this discrepant or anomalous result that the pendulum clock slowed in Kayi, two and a half minutes a day. What we can get from this is a certain 
schematic understanding of the testing of scientific theory. It's not just that theory by itself implies some observation that we go out then and test. Rather, it's theory along with certain conditions implies some observation. We go out and test. And if our observation is not found to be so or not as predicted, then either the theory is false or the associated conditions that we state are false. The theory was that the Earth is spherical. And if the Earth is spherical, the implied observation is that the time of the swing <coughs> of the pendulum will not vary anywhere on the Earth's surface. But it did vary. Therefore, how do we, is the theory false? Well, there could be these other conditions. Huygens went through each of the conditions, or at least science at the time went through each of the conditions and found that no, all of the conditions were as stated. What Huygens showed mathematically was that the centrifugal, people said, well, the centrifugal effects can result in the slowing. At the equator, bodies are being thrown off. At the pole, bodies have no tendency to be thrown off. The globe rotates. If you're standing at the pole, nothing happens to you. If you're standing at the equator, there's a centrifugal effect to throw you off. And the impact of the centrifugal effect is to diminish the force of gravity. In other words, what Huygens said was that the Earth is spherical, the force of gravity is diminished at the equator because of the centrifugal effect, bodies are being thrown off, therefore effective gravity is decreased, and if effective gravity is being decreased, then the body will uh, uh, swing faster, which means you have to shorten in order to bring it back. Well, this sounded pretty convincing. Yes, centrifugal effects. We all know from being on a swinging disc that the further out you are on the disc, the more you're going to be thrown off. If you stand in the very center, you have no centrifugal effect. Therefore, if you're at the edge, you get thrown off. This explains the slowing uh, uh, of the pendulum. And therefore, we can preserve our theory of a spherical Earth. Huygens worked out mathematically what the centrifugal effect was, given the diameter of the Earth and given the speed of rotation of the Earth, he worked out what it was, and he found that it translated, it accounted for just 1.5 millimeter of the three millimeters that had to be, the pendulum had to be shortened. 1.5 millimeter, you can barely see 1.5 millimeter. But on the basis of that, Huygens overturned for himself, his assumption of a spherical Earth. He said, no, the Earth is oblate. Uh, it's not spherical. And the, his proposed universal uh, standard of length uh, could not be universal because the pendulum is going to change speed uh, as you move around the Earth's surface. Well, a very interesting story. And uh, Voltaire, one of the great Enlightenment philosophers, uh, followed this whole story with some interest. Voltaire wrote, in consequence of this, it was discovered that whereas the gravity of bodies is by so much the less powerful as these bodies are further removed from the center of the Earth, the region of the equator must absolutely be much more elevated than that of France, 
and so much be further removed from the centre, and therefore that the earth could not be a sphere. Many philosophers on occasion of these discoveries did what men usually do in points concerning which it is requisite to change their opinion. They opposed the newly discovered truth. <coughs> well, the moral of the story is that Huygens, on the basis of this tiny 1.5 millimeter difference, changed his whole theory of a regular Earth. These are modern-day pictures. I won't elaborate on them, but you get the general uh, idea. This solved the longitude problem. I won't elaborate that either, and I won't elaborate that. Dava Sobel, in her book on longitude, uh, discusses very interestingly how solving longitude enabled so much of European domination of the rest of the world in terms of navigation, warfare, trade, uh, communication, and everything else. Um, Harrison's plops, I won't. <coughs> the pendulum and curriculum emphases. There's been a long-standing tension between three purposes of science education that get reflected in science curriculum. One, a cultural purpose. Better under we, we study science in order to better understand our present and our past. An applied emphasis. We study science uh, in order to know how to function in a technological world. As uh, a sociologist of fame, uh, of, uh, of science, uh, uh, said some years ago, uh, we study science in order to know where to put the souffle in the oven. <laughs> and third, a disciplinary reason. That is, we study science so that people can uh, be prepared to do chemistry one at university or physics one at university. The cultural applied and disciplinary goals need not be inconsistent. Liberal education or a liberal cur curriculum is the appropriate combination of all three, cultural, disciplinary, and applied. And we have examples of such liberal curriculum, famous uh, the Harvard, uh, Harvard Report 1945 of James Conant. Science instruction in general education should be characterized mainly by broad integrative elements. Comparison of scientific thought with other modes of thought. Comparison and contrast of the individual sciences with one another. The relations of science with its own past and with general human history. And of science with problems of human society. This is repeated in the AAAS document 1990. Uh, it's repeated in the U.S. National Science Education Standards. I won't go into them. I won't go into that. Let me jump to almost the end. The school curriculum is normally divided into different subjects or different disciplines. For instance, religion, history, science, philosophy, technology, mathematics, economics, uh, go on and on. Within each uh, subject in the school curriculum, you have different topics. Often, not only are the subjects unrelated to each other, but the topics within a subject are unrelated to each other. What I'm suggesting is that if you take a topic in physics or any other topic in science, I've recently been doing work on photosynthesis of much the same kind as this work on the pendulum. If you take a topic in physics such as pendulum motion and you deal with it in a historical way and if you deal with it in a philosophical way, then you can make connections with other topics in other subjects 
in the school program. So the pendulum uh, in history can, <coughs> for instance, connect with issues of timekeeping, navigation, European colonization and expansion. In philosophy, it can connect with topics of, uh, uh, of idealization, topics of theory testing. Uh, in technology, it can connect with, for instance, timekeeping, making of clocks, uh, and in religion, it can connect most famously, for instance, with the uh, design arguments for the existence of God, the famous mm -hmm. arguments that the, the world functions like a clock, it is regular like a clock. You can't have regular functioning as with a clock unless you have a clock make maker. Mm -hmm. You can't have a regular world unless there is a world maker. Uh, well, this talk is just a contribution of history and philosophy to science teaching. It's something that the International History, Philosophy and Science Teaching Group tries to promote. Uh, I've been involved with that group for some long while. It has a website that you can go to and see varied things. And I thank you for your...